building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and the courses of Emory built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. The name of today's scripture is, I'm sorry, sermon is, it's time to rebuild. Nehemiah was the third great leader in the Jewish restoration. Zerubbabel led the first group of exiles back to Jerusalem in 538 to 537 BC and supervised the building of the temple. Eighty years later, Ezra, the scribe, came to Jerusalem with a second group of Jews, bringing reforms through his ministry of God's word. However, over time, things began to degenerate in Jerusalem. Thirteen years after Ezra's expedition, Nehemiah was distressed by the conditions in Jerusalem. Nehemiah's brother, Hanani, came from Judah with some other men, and informed Nehemiah that those who survived the exile returned to the province but were in great trouble. They were disgraced because the wall of Jerusalem was broken down and its gates had been burned with fire. Nehemiah was deeply troubled, deeply distressed by this report that the city where his forefathers lived lie in ruins and its gates were destroyed by fire. He mourned for the condition of Jerusalem for days and began to fast and pray. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, a very important or influential position and had favor from God. When King Artaxerxes saw how sad Nehemiah was over the condition of Jerusalem, he granted him permission to return to Jerusalem with armed protection and resources. Nehemiah had a prayer and he had a plan to rebuild God's city, even though the likelihood of being able to rebuild Jerusalem looked slim because the city lie in ruins. The gates were destroyed by fire and the people who survived the exile and returned to the province felt very disgraced. The wall of Jerusalem was broken down. Nehemiah prayed fervently, passionately to God. He acknowledged that the Israelites, including himself, acted very wickedly toward God. He acknowledged that they had not obeyed God's commands, his decrees, or his laws that were given to them through Moses. He also asked for favor from God after he acknowledged the sins of the Israelites. He did not try to take on this great task or project on his own skill, ability, or merit. Through the king, God granted him armed protection and resources to take to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the wall. In chapter 2, verse 8, Nehemiah said, Because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. His request was to return to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem's wall and gates that were burned by fire so the Israelites would no longer be disgraced. God's city lie in ruins because of Israel's idolatry and wickedness, and Nehemiah was determined to rebuild it. The book of Nehemiah is a great example of the success that can be accomplished when God's people have a dedicated discerning zeal for the work of God. According to the dictionary, zeal is a, a great energy, a great enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Nehemiah and his co-laborers were focused and on a mission to begin to rebuild God's city. Nehemiah surveyed the ruins of the city independently and in an organized manner he assigned tasks to all who were willing to participate. Men, women, priests, artisans, princes, rulers, commoners, all labored side by side. They worked as a team joined together by a common zeal. 
their goal to rebuild Jerusalem, God's city. Each person or group dedicated to the details and the grunt work necessary to repair his or their section of the wall with a strong foundation. There was only one case of disunity. The nobles of Tekoa did not want to put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors in chapter 3, verse 5 of the book of Nehemiah. However, the other men of Tekoa completed not only one section of the wall, but two sections of the wall. Even though this one case of disunity occurred, each person or group realized that even though they were assigned to one part of the wall, it would take the collaborative effort of all of them to have a completed successful project as an end result, one that they could all be proud of, which is why they had to work as a cohesive unit. They understood the concept that the church was one body made of many parts and that each part had its own role to play. No one left their role to interfere with someone else's role. Each person stayed in their own lane and used the gifts and talents God gave them to do the work that they were assigned to. There was no task that was too big or too small. Titles were not important. The only thing that was important was the rebuilding of a wall which was greater than all of them. And they were all glued together by a common zeal for God. Through King Artaxerxes, God gave these men and women the authority to rebuild and they took the work seriously and they accomplished the task. They were not only building a wall, but they were building a community. They were building a family. They were building unity in Christ. And they were glad to do the work. Yesterday, we went to the quarterly conference. And when we went to the quarterly conference, Elder Maven stated that it was time to make the church great again. And we can learn a lot from this scripture about the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3, 1 through 3. So it says, how, how can we make the church great again? And, and what does he mean when he says make the church great again? So he explained yesterday that, you know, he was playing off of President Trump's words about making the United States great again. But that wasn't the point. The point was that the church is not exactly where it needs to be today. And so what can be done in order for the church to get back to its original intent the way God planned for it to be? And so he brought up the book of Acts. And he said that if we look back at the actions and the mindset of the first church led by the disciples in the book of Acts, then we would have a starting point about what we're supposed to do when we're in the church. So in the book of Acts, I, I looked it up and I, I read through it, and it said they all joined together constantly for prayer. Um, they consistently sought Jesus' face when he departed from them. They were witnesses to the fact that God had raised Jesus to life, testifying that he was the Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching about Jesus and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their possessions and goods so they could give to anyone as they had need. And every day they met together in the temple courts and broke bread together in their homes and they ate together with gladness and a sincere heart. They praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Due to their actions, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So why am I telling you all of this? Why am I going back? to the early church. I am going back to the early church because it's time to rebuild. I said earlier, this is not one of those hallelujah sermons, but I'm going to say what God gave me to say, and I'm not going to be apologetic about it. So it says here, it's time to rebuild. 
So for the past year or so, I have heard Elder Maven say that we have to review our practices and we have to determine how we can move forward and move closer to being the church God called us to be. He said it on more than one occasion. If we focus on the scripture at hand, we can learn from Nehemiah how to move forward when it appears as if the state or conditions of the church is at its worst. When Nehemiah heard of the condition of the city of Jerusalem from his brother, he sat down and he wept. He was grieved by how the great Jerusalem, the city of Almighty God, had fallen. Not due to any lack on God's part, it wasn't God's fault, but due to the Israelites' unfaithfulness to God and their wickedness. He mourned, he fasted, he prayed day and night before the God of heaven for days on behalf of the people of Israel. He acknowledged and confessed the sins of the Israelites, including himself and his father's house, that were committed against God. He acknowledged how God warned the Israelites in advance of what would occur if they were unfaithful. He told the Israelites he would scatter them among the nations of the earth if they didn't remain faithful. But if the Israelites returned to God and obeyed his commands, then God would gather the exiles back from the farthest places on the earth and bring them to live in a place that he would choose as his dwelling, where he wanted his name to reside. God would give them another chance if they repented. To move forward and begin the process of rebuilding, the next step for the members of Williams Chapel is to pray individually at home about what task or assignment God needs each one of us to complete and then come together as a collective to kneel before God, acknowledge that we have fallen and that we are not operating as the way that he called us to be. We have to fast and pray about what to do next and then do it with the dedication and zeal exemplified by Nehemiah and his co-laborers in Christ. Each group or individual doing his part to his or her best ability, relying on God to grant us favor and rebuild what has been broken. It's time to return to the beliefs and activities carried out by the first church and disciples so God will draw men and women and children into this house. Activities that we do in the church, we all mean well. So activities that we do in the church, um, anything that we choose to fundraise, we all mean well by it. But, but the question that we just have to start asking ourselves is, are we doing all that God intended for us to do? So are we down here on earth in the same being the salt and the light of the earth? Or are we doing other activities just for the purpose of fundraising? And I know that fundraising has its purpose, I understand. But it's just something that we just have to look at. If we are doing what God called us to do, then let us do it with joy and gladness if we go into this self-reflection. As the elder stated yesterday, people are glad to go to a party. I was glad to go to my class reunion last week. I am glad when people throw a birthday party for me. We are excited to go to football practice, cheerleading practice. We're glad to get in a car and drive for two hours and go to an amusement park. Um, and some people are glad to get up and go to work if they love what they do. But are we happy when we come to church? Do we come into God's house with a sense of joy and gratitude? Or do we come into his house as if we're only here because we feel as though it's an obligation or a duty. God does not need our hallelujahs. He can enable the rocks to praise him if he wanted to. Didn't he make the donkey Balaam was riding on speak to him as plainly as you and me? But I would hope that we would want to praise him and be glad to be even a doorkeeper in his house because of his spirit, his calmness, his peace, his awesomeness that comes from him every day, every hour, every second. 
He really is the bright light of the world, our shining hope in the midst of the darkness that we live in. There is no one like him on this earth. We are not doing God any favors by attending church Sunday by Sunday. He is helping us by giving believers, as well as the mentally and physically sick, a place to retreat, get well, and regain strength in fellowship and prayer week by week so we can face another day here on this earth. God doesn't need us. We need him. If we ask ourselves the question as to whether or not we are doing what God called us to do, as Nehemiah reflected on the actions of the Israelites, and if the answer comes out to be no, that we're not doing what God asks us to do, then it's time to rebuild and change our practices. It's time to look at what the Bible asks us to do and do it while we still have breath in our bodies on this earth. It's time that we consistently do right by God with the zeal, enthusiasm, and dedication exemplified by Nehemiah and the early saints. They were glad to gather together. They found joy and they found comfort in each other's company. They just wanted to dwell on the word of the living God and be disciples, sharing the message to whoever would listen. Nehemiah had a passion for the truth of God's word no matter what the cost no matter what the consequence. He was determined not to let anyone distract him with nonsense or slow him down from completing the plan that God gave him to rebuild God's city. It is a zeal that we must pray to God for so we can get back up out of the state that we are in today, William Chapel. And if God, in his infinite mercy, hears our prayer and forgives us, grants us another chance, and gives us the authority and resources to move forward as he did for Nehemiah, then when we are done with our projects and tasks that we have undertaken, we need to dedicate it back to the Lord as Nehemiah and his co-laborers did. Because only what you're gonna do for God or for Christ will last. Even when I say that right now, I work a lot. I've always worked a lot. It's a problem that I have to a certain degree. So I'm just going to talk to you for a second. And as I get older, I'm starting to understand that it is better to serve God and have one handful of toil and one handful of tranquility instead of having two handfuls of toil for this world and things come to naught. So if I'm going to work that hard, I might as well work hard for God, which is going to reap a bigger or a better benefit. So if we're going to rebuild, we have to ask ourselves an important question. What exactly did God call us to do? What did he intend for man to do while he was here on this earth? What habits can we lay to rest in our individual lives that call us to tread further and further away from what God called us to be? What practices are missing from this church that causes us to be farther away from what we were called to be as a body of Christ? When Jesus preached the Beatitudes on the mountain, he explained exactly what God called us to be. He said, we are to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, both individually and collectively. He said, we are, he said, blessed are the meek, the quiet, the gentle, the humble, the obedient, for they will inherit the earth. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who, who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when, you, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of him. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were there before you. He called us not to be angry at our brothers, so we will not be subject to judgment. He called us not to resist an evil person. He called us to give to the one who asks you and to not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And he called us to give to the needy in secret, because your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 
He calls us to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that your sons, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Whenever it rains, God doesn't say let the rain fall down on that house at 286 Henry Street, but don't let it fall down on the rain or rain at 287 Henry Street, regardless of who lives in both houses. He gives to both. He called us not to worry. He called us not to judge. And last but not least, he called us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything he commanded the disciples to do. To conclude the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And after he gave the Great Commission, he says, surely, if you do these things, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Williams Chapel, if we choose to rebuild, we have to make sure that we put this mindset and habits or practices into place so that we will have the foundation of a mighty rock, Jesus Christ, and succeed as a church body, remembering that he will be with us always if we adhere to this mindset to the best of our ability. For Jesus himself said, only he who does the will of my Father in heaven will enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is what God called us to do. So if Almighty God grants us mercy from this day forward and allows us to rebuild, we have to ask ourselves, will the activities that we have selected help us work toward what he called us to be, or will it bring us further away? It is time to rebuild. It's time to rebuild Bible class and attend. In Psalm 1, it states, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prosper. It is time to rebuild devotional services and give testimonies in the morning and invite the Spirit of God into this place before we start praising Him and start service. It's time to rebuild Sunday school for the children and the adults. Another opportunity where we can learn about the Word of God and digest the bread of life. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, it states, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be great in the kingdom of heaven. It's time to rebuild the evangelism department. He called us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything he commanded the disciples to do. It's time to pray together on a consistent basis. That prayer meeting that we're supposed to have is actually time for us to actually have it. The Bible states the prayers of the righteous availeth much, and where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. And it's time for us to come to church on time. And I'm talking to myself too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, it states, All things should be done decently and in order. God is not late to help us or to listen to us when we're having trouble 2 o'clock in the morning. So it's time for us to stop coming to his house late when we have, and we have to respect God and the roles that he has given to us. And it's time to rebuild choir rehearsal. In Psalm 100, it states, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, come to his presence and singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfastness love, his steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm tired of hearing it myself. But like Pastor Lancaster said, like it's just time for us to stop playing. So we just have to stop playing church. So we have to be the salt of the earth. And the only way we can be the salt of the earth is if we diligently search in the Bible for what God intended for man to do while he walks on this earth. Because a time is going to come when it's going to be your turn to depart from here. And all of us are going to be held accountable for whatever it is he told us to do. Everyone has a time to leave from here. So we have to do what God called us to do as Nehemiah and his co-laborers did. 
It's time to agree to meet, repent, pray, examine our practices, and rededicate ourselves to God's work. Rebuild based on what the scriptures have told us to do. Nehemiah knew God was with him and he was going to give him success. So if we believe, God will give us success as well. My sermon by paper is over. Amen.